But some brilliant people at PBS and ABC said, wait a minute, I can inject data into my TV signal? What if I made that into words and had a decoder that could take that data and turn it into words on screen? Boom, closed captioning was invented. Hello, welcome to the Hearsay Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Passiello, Chief Accessibility Officer here at OUI. Today, I'll be chatting with a longtime friend and colleague in the accessibility industry, Larry Goldberg. Larry is the former head of accessibility at Yahoo, WGBH, and NCAM, as well as Verizon. I've had the privilege of knowing Larry for some 30 years, and his professional journey in the accessibility field spans several decades. Larry, it's great to be here with you again. We're excited to learn more about your experience with accessibility in the media industry. Thanks for joining us. Larry, you and I go back uh, probably as long as both of us have been in the accessibility industry. Great to be here with you. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Mike. Yeah, we have known each other for quite a while, going back to when you were with DEC. And now I live only a couple of miles from where you used to work. So it comes full circle. Yeah, it, it's it's pretty phenomenal. I, I was actually thinking back to when we first met. So I was at DEC until 1996, but I think you and I met well before that, at least somewhere around 92, 93. Uh, we were already working on web accessibility at that particular time. The one event that really struck a chord with me that I was thinking back was when uh, GBH uh, threw a big event. I think it was at the Shapiro Center in Axel LeBlanc was the uh, keynote speaker. Do you remember that? I don't remember what year that was. Oh, sure. And Axel now, of course, from uh, the IAAP and G3ICT was head of Honeywell Bull. And Axel, which was right next door to WGBH, and they were a wonderful sponsor. And so Axel and I got to know each other going way, way back, even before the new GBH building was built. So, yeah, that sounds like what our roots might be. You know, that's something I, Axel and I, like you and I, we talk all we talk all the time. I didn't I didn't realize that Bull and Honeywell were right next door to, to uh, GBH, right down there. But that was in Cambridge. Is that Cambridge, right? No, that's Brighton. Brighton right? Landing. Okay. Yeah. Well, Larry, I, one of the things that we want to do is introduce you to our audience. You and I know each other for decades, uh, and I think most of the accessibility world knows you. But give us a little bit of your background. How did you get started in accessibility? You know, what turned you on to uh, especially being involved in the area of, of, uh, of media and accessibility? Yeah, I think my roots really are as a media geek from the earliest days. A lot of people come into accessibility from so many different routes. For me, it was photography, it was filmmaking. And both of my grandfathers were very big on visual arts. And my paternal grandfather, um, Michael Markowitz, had this camera. And I'm showing a Leica M3. When he passed on, I got this camera. I had no idea what to do with it. I was only like eight years old. Don't put the camera like this in my hands. And I began trying to take it apart. Ooh, not a good idea. This is a miracle of German engineering. One of the most beautiful cameras ever made the same year I was born, in fact, 1954. So I began taking pictures with this amazing camera and I just fell in love with it. Friend had a dark room. I began to actually work in a dark room. And then my mother opened up a bank account nearby where I was growing up in New Jersey. And remember how they used to give gifts when you open a bank account? Right. They gave my mother this Super 8 camera. Now, I don't know how many of the folks in this audience know what a Super 8 camera is, but I'm holding a piece of plastic that is not elegantly designed by a long shot. And I began making films, Super 8 films. And that was it. I was hooked. That's From amazing. there, I made films all through high school. I went to State University of New York in Bingham to study filmmaking transferred to the University of Southern California to start making TV shows, radio, anything having to do with media. I put my hands on porta packs and half inch and three quarter inch video. And that really uh, struck me as this is going to be my career. That's it. And as I advise lots of students these days, when they say, what's your path? I'm looking to get a job. I say, find a company you admire and you want to work at and, and then work your way in, whatever it may be. 
And to me, it was WGBH, Public Broadcasting in Boston. Really the pinnacle of production and distribution and content in the Boston area where I was working. So I applied for jobs at WGBH, couldn't even get an interview. Uh, and I kind of gave up, moved to New York, started doing freelance video production. And then, remember classified ads, the New York Times had a little tiny classified ad, WGBH Caption Center, looking for an operations manager in New York City. I actually knew what closed captioning was. That was my interview. Do you know what closed captioning is? Yes, you're hired. Because <laughs> uh, it was early. It was early in the days of closed captioning. Yeah, and I yeah. finally got my job with GBH in a New York office running closed captioning out of a New York office. And that is where it all began. That's amazing. I had no idea that you had had that background. Now, this has got to be, it's got to be an 80s. So we talk about the mid 80s, late 80s. 1985. Yeah, exactly. And I was at DEC. I started in 82 when I started going down the path of, of Braille and, and, um, uh, you know, documentation, um, accessibility. So our paths are really kind of aligned pretty, pretty closely. Now, now correct me if I'm wrong. At that time, um, were there any standards in place for captioning? Well, there was a technical standard that came out of an amazing development. WGBH had been putting words on their TV shows since the 70s, but they were burned in. They were open captions. They were open subtitles. Julia Child's French Chef, the trivia question on what was the first show with captions. But there was no closed caption, no way to insert the data and that hampered the growth of closed captioning because producers just didn't want words on screen. Right. And so the National Institute of Standards and Technology was testing out a new mechanism for setting clocks universally across the country. And their idea was to inject data in broadcast streams so that local TV stations would have the ground truth for what time it was. However, unfortunately, there was lag and delay, so the time clock setting of this data injection failed miserably. The time was just drifting everywhere, but some brilliant people at PBS and ABC said, wait a minute, I can inject data into my TV signal? What if I made that into words and had a decoder that could take that data and turn it into words on screen? Boom, closed captioning was invented. 1980 that happened, and the first test began with broadcasters and PBS and ABC, and then CBS became the first broadcasters to actually attempt to inject this data into a TV signal, and then deaf people had to go out and buy this closed caption decoder box, this huge clunky, eh, kind of expensive device, and when they plugged it into their TV, they could push a button. And up would pop the words. And that's where closed captioning started and really took off. It gave the user choice, didn't, quote, interfere with hearing people's uh, enjoyment of TV, but you can hide it into any TV signal. And that's how it began. Now, so are we talking at that point, are we talking open captions or closed captions at that point? Because this is we're, we're talking strictly captioning for TV for all intents and purposes. Well, that in 1980 became closed captioning. The data standard was uh, a standard that uh, everyone adopted. It was what's called line 21 data. Okay, you remember that. Uh, yeah. And that was in the 21st line of the vertical blanking interval on your TV analog TV signal. That black bar that would roll past you if you happen to be saying that, oh, that doesn't exist anymore in digital. But line 21 data injection at a very slow data rate. So it was robust. It was solid. It maintained through many hops through the broadcast uh, system. And that was a data format that was accepted. Uh, CBS came up with a different one, line 18, with a much higher data uh uh, put through, but it was not robust. So CBS gave up on their uh, what was called extra vision and everyone settled on line 21 data. And that's what existed all the way through until digital television came about. That's very cool. 30, 35, 35 years of, of us going together. And that's really the kind of history that I, I kind of had a, you know, a, a blurry vision of how things came about, but this was nice and detailed. I, I'm sure our, our hearsay uh, folks that uh, are watching, so we'll appreciate that. Now, 
From there, at what point, so you're an operations manager, you know, are you still in New York or have you moved up to Boston? How did you get linked up with the Shapiro Center and then eventually uh, NCAMP? Yeah, uh, I was in New York and what the New York office was doing was serving the network advertising industry. So programs were captioned, but ads were not. And of course, if you're doing advertising, you got to be in New York, Madison Avenue. So the idea was we would service major ad agencies and advertisers by adding closed captions to their ads. And I was in charge of advertising uh, captioning. 30-second spots, we would do a few hundred a week, fast turnaround, make versions of the new master with the data and ship it back. And that was a single master that all ads were then copied from. So whenever an ad would play, it would have the data, caption data in it. After three years in New York, uh, 85 to 88, the head of the caption center in Boston uh, decided to take uh, a leave, maternity leave, and they moved me up and asked me to take over the caption center, which at that time had offices in Boston, New York, and L.A., of course, L.A. to service the TV industry. Right. We had well over 100 people doing uh, captioning for CBS, PBS, HBO, NBC, uh, all the major networks. And it was a boom time industry, really phenomenal. Shortly thereafter, we actually started developing real-time captioning for live news. And doing that with court reporters, we eventually called them steno captioners. And they were providing captioning for local news in Boston and eventually national news. Very cool. Very cool. So I, I want to branch off a little bit, but at some point you got even more involved in the standards activity, right? Because we need to, we, we knew that there was a need to formalize these standards primarily because the internet now is starting to come around. We're in the early nineties. The internet is out there. Um, and the web is, you know, a year or two away from, from Tim, uh, you know, putting out the first, first aspects of that. I, I believe the first digital standards or, or caption standards were at least being worked on if they already, if V1 wasn't already in place with the FCC, right? Yeah, yeah. It's funny to go from uh, analog broadcasting to digital, all of a sudden you had so many more choices. Uh, in the old days, broadcast standards were locked down. Everyone were broadcasting the same way, VHF, UHF. There weren't a lot of choices. Right. Digital comes along, and all of a sudden, you have a giant pipeline, lots of ways to add data to your video signal, and the FCC had to pull people together and figure out what we're going to do, because you were also streaming using QuickTime and RealPlayer, all kinds of ways of distributing video online. So uh, the FCC pulled together this issue um, to try to standardize. They weren't going to lock in just one but they had what was called a safe haven. And that became what's known as SIMPTI TT. And that was uh, SIMPTI being a standards organization, Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, and TT for Time Text. And that really became the core of how you would embed data uh, in any kind of video stream. Others were developed by Google for YouTube and by Apple. Um, they became interoperable. There are still to this day about a dozen different ways of adding data to a video signal, but the safe haven and the one particularly for massive distribution became Simpty TT and some of its uh, offshoots. Interesting. Not to get off of the topic of, of accessibility, but were you involved at, at, at all with the SAP uh, channel and, mm. and, and what went on? Because we're talking about language and translation at that particular time, too. Yeah, I was the caption guy, so I uh, got to know people in the deaf community and went to deaf conventions, learned all about caption data. My sister organization was Descriptive Video Service, also invented by WGBH and Barry Cronin, who was my boss was operating uh, the DVS side for audio description. And he, again, a brilliant but random kind of discovery, uh, broadcasters realized when they invented stereo TV, they had room for a secondary audio program. So they said, oh, you know what? This would be great for Spanish language. We're going to open up a separate channel. Users can flip over to Spanish. Well, turns out most broadcasters weren't all that interested in broadcasting Spanish and paying for it. 
So Barry and his team said, well, we're going to use it for blind people. And we're going to describe programs in the SAP channel, mix the program audio with the narrator, and we'll have descriptive video. Eventually, it started being called audio description. Um, and when the head of that department, a woman named uh, Lori Everett, decided to move on, uh, I was asked to take over both. So we merged the two departments, Caption Center and DVS became the Media Access Group at WGBH. And at this point, I got to know a lot of blind people and to begin to learn what makes for good audio description. And GBH had been doing amazing work creating VHS cassettes with description and broadcasting description on PBS and CBS. And we now started using the SAP channel. And of course, in digital TV, that morphed into an ancillary audio channel um, and became something that become even more widely distributed. So I got to know deaf people. I got mixed in with the blind community. Some of them became my best friends. Um, and it was a nice merger of the two. Yeah. Don't take this the wrong way, but, but, but most of them are still your best friends. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, I can't help but just watch this timeline, just kind of good timeline go go forward, you know, between the two of us and how things are running in parallel uh, in terms of our, in terms of our career. So let's, let's just set aside WGBH uh, for a moment. Uh, eventually you went next, I think to Yahoo, right? And then well, I should, I, we should mention the National Center for Accessible Media. Well, okay, good. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Uh, that's the next evolution that in the early nineties, we realized that technology was particularly internet technology was taking off like a shot. And no one was really dealing with accessibility there, particularly media accessibility. Again, my brilliant boss, Barry Cronin, reached out to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, got a million-dollar grant to start up an R&D group, the National Center for Accessible Media, to really take on the question of how are we going to make these technologies accessible? How are we going to bring captioning description into the new world? How can we help some big companies get up to speed? So we were a consulting group, too. And then the wonderful development team at GBH reached out to the Shapiro Family Foundation, and they embraced it. They loved the idea of putting their name and supporting this idea of expanding technology and media to people with disabilities. And that became NCAM, the National Center for Accessible Media, still robust and doing wonderful work today at WGBH, and really helped develop technologies, standards, policies. It enabled me to get involved in federal policy and the laws, which I believe we'll be talking about. Yeah. Um, and uh, we were involved in setting standards and, and legislative and regulatory issues as well. Yeah, too many conversations I can think of. So <laughs> it, it's at NCAM that Magpie came about. So yeah. you brought you brought this this accessibility technology, so to speak, to the desktop, to to everyday users, right? So talk yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, the idea of do it yourself really also became very popular and YouTube, people posting their own videos. But we weren't gonna wind up captioning and describing every video everyone made. So Brad Bodkin, my buddy over at NCAM, developed software called MagPi, Mag for Media Access Group, Pi for previously incarnated as Elijah. No one knows this. Brad's kid's that. name was Elijah. And he wanted to call the software Elijah. But then we combined the two and we called it MagPi and gave it away for free. Yep. And so people could do their own captioning yeah. using time code. And outputting one of these standard formats uh, that we're using for captioning. That's been updated and updated over the years, still exists now as Cadet, C A D E T, but it was DIY software. And it was so much fun to develop that. Amazing. Yeah, I, I loved it. I just loved it. Of course, we used it at TPG uh, for many years just to do, you know, with our clients re requesting that we do. Uh, both the captioning and we could do the descriptive video um, and, and put that narration in with with those tools. It kind of reminds me, I mean, I think of some of the early tools that we had for accessibility on the desktop level. So Magpie was one of them, as was Bobby, right? And between cast and 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 uh and WGBH, we, we we had a lot, we had a lot of fun building those tools. Well, let me interject that cast, which developed Bobby, is turning 40 this year, and they're Amazing. having a big celebration of their 40th anniversary. 
Yeah, it's David, David uh, and, and uh, Chuck David Spilier. Rose yeah. uh, is on the board emeritus, and Meyer was his co-founder. Chuck Hitchcock has moved on, but okay. Skip Stahl is the name you may remember. Right. Skip is still an advisor there, and they're doing great. Yeah. So all the folks, again, that are watching this uh, this <laughs> podcast are starting to hear really some of the early days, the early history. You all are involved in the web, and this is a lot of this is pre-web. Uh, or the very very early days uh, of of the web um, after it had been released, it's it's analogous to um, the graph first graphical browser with with uh, Mosaic when that mm-hmm. got introduced. Mm-hmm. All, All right. of these things are starting to come together, Larry. Right? We've got these tools. We're pushing. Uh, correct me again if I'm wrong, but I believe that before there were way, the way keg standards actually became part of you know uh, the Web Accessibility Initiative at at, uh, at the W3C. Trace with Greg Vanderheiden and NCAM with, with yourself and then a few others of us uh, that were out there had already functionally built a lot of the initial standards and guidelines that today we know, at least in part, as the WCAG standards. Isn't that true? Yeah, we were kind of off on our own proposing this is how it should be, but we didn't really have the uh, connections to make a global standard out of it. So when the W3C embraced it, then we were off and running because this then became blessed as a official standard that HTML and the other web standards were, everyone had to use them. Uh, So we no longer had to say best seen in Netscape, best seen in IE. No, everyone was going to do it the same way. And WCAG became something very much like that and that early work on well, what's the best kind of user experience and how do we get there was done by organizations, as you said, like Cast and Trace and NCAM and, and lots of others. You know, some of this history, if my uh, co-author, Alan Brightman, who founded Apple Accessibility and I can get our act together, we're going to write a book and we're going to awesome. document all of this history because to us anyway, it was some great stuff and some great stories to be told. We, we, we definitely need to do that. We could talk about uh, endless, endless stories that all of us have. But again, to help our audience understand just a little bit of the timeline, we're talking about the late 90s now. 1997 was when we launched uh, the Web Accessibility Initiative out at Stanford as part of the uh, W3C web conference back then. Um, and at that time, already in place were uh, the, the guidelines that have been developed at NCAM, the guidelines that have been developed uh, at Trace under under Greg Vanderheiden, the Trace Research Center at the University of of, of Madison at was you know Wisconsin at Madison, right? And then I, as I mentioned, a few of us in the private industry like myself, George Kirscher, and a few others that were working on documentation standards using uh, SGML, which was really the mother, if you will, of 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 HTML. And we had already started; we'd already written um, a DTD or document type definition fragment that got adopted by the American Association of Publishers. So you see those standards pulled together became really the foundation for the WCAG standards as we know them and know them yeah. today. So yeah. Uh, yeah. very I, interesting. I didn't even know what a markup language was until yeah. George Kirscher, bless his heart, yeah. sat me down at CSUN one time. I was like, oh, you don't know about SGML? Well, sit down. I'm going to tell you all about it. Yeah. Wow, what a learning experience that was. Amazing stuff, right? Yeah. And we had some great meetings. Uh, we had, it, it harkens back to Yuri Rubinsky, who had started SoftQuad, and, and uh, Goldfarb himself, Charles Goldfarb, who actually in, invented uh, the standard generalized markup language when he was at IBM. All of us were working together. And what was great was watching people like Goldfarb, uh, Rubinsky, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, and then on our end, yourself, Jim Thatcher was was heavily involved, uh, um, uh, George Kirsch, as you mentioned, and others of us. Just at the very beginning of of this, what would launch into the world that we live in today, and that's digital accessibility. Yeah. So let's take it from there again. We're kind of fast forwarding a little bit. Move on to what happened. You left GBH and NCAM. Move on to Yahoo. Uh, you were was it was Alan there with you at Yahoo? Well, it's interesting. Um, Alan was at uh, Yahoo. And well, before that, um, he was at Apple. And he and I had been working together quite a bit. 
And Yahoo was one of NCAM's clients. They wanted, and so was AOL, interestingly, they wanted to make their software accessible. And remember, AOL used to send out those disks all the time, yeah. but it was a closed system. Right. So there was no way to make it accessible. And they realized they needed to do that, especially because they were being sued by the NFB. So they came to NCAM and said, we need help uh, making our software accessible. We're going to be moving it to the web uh, instead of on a dial up on a disk. And so we sent a person uh, who was on the NCAM staff down to Northern Virginia to spend most of his time teaching AOL engineers how to make their software accessible. That person is Tom Litkowski, now vice Pre president for accessibility at Comcast. And basically AOL stole him away and uh, hired him. And Tom eventually went from AOL to Comcast and I think for AOL, those engineers, probably the first time they ever met a blind person, and they learned an awful lot from Tom. And that really started an awful, a tremendous amount. Yahoo had the same problem. They wanted to make their software accessible. They came to NCAM and said, we want to hire someone. Do you know anyone? I said, well, there's this guy, Alan Brightman. He's available. So Alan became the first head of accessibility at Yahoo after Apple. Um and then I was involved in some of the laws that were being developed. You know, of course, the biggie, the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, known as the CVAA, massive impact, had a chance to write some of it, especially the media parts, negotiate aspects of it, and go to the White House to be there when it was signed. Stevie Wonder was there and our Senator Markey and so many others. Not too long afterwards, the FCC approached me, asked if I would co-chair the committee that would write the regulations that came out of the uh, bill, which was a great honor. And it was amazing to work with industry and advocates in 18 months, put together the regs, the CVA regs. And then um, the guy who was now head of accessibility at Yahoo, Mike Shabanek, uh, approached me and said, would you uh, consider ever leaving GBH? Because you don't need your help. Now that there's a law, you need to know how to comply. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. I'm really interested in seeing how the the big boys in the uh, for-profit world can get this out the door. So I moved from GBH. 29 years I was at GBH. Went to Yahoo. Uh, eventually became head of accessibility at Yahoo. Uh, because of the law. So here's a, a lesson for anyone looking for a job. Get a law passed that requires your skills. Works Absolute. just great for me. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I, a close friend of mine in the uh, venture capital world told me there are two ways to create an industry, if you will, or, or, or uh, attract an industry. One is, you know, you, you invent a Facebook. Right. You invent a technology that just becomes the next, you know, the, the, the next uh, uh, big thing, so, so to speak. Or you create a law to enforce what would happen. So, you know, what you said there, I mean, be between 255 and CVAA, Larry, uh, you were integral to that. As, of course, you mentioned Alan. Mike is over at Meta now. I've, I just talked to him last week. Alan and I talk back and forth all the time. He's, he's down in New York, right? Living it. So, uh, these are, these are friends for everybody again that's watching our hearsay pod, podcast. These, these are the icons of our industry. This is a foundation of at least digital accessibility. Now, there were a lot of friends of ours and colleagues that you and I both had the privilege of working with over the years where maybe the analog aspect of accessibility. But as we ventured our careers, we, I think, paved the path for a lot of our friends and colleagues. And there's a lot of folks that we haven't even talked about. You know, I think of Karen Pell Strauss and, 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 and others uh, along that line uh, where, where they were just instrumental in ensuring that these laws, as, as you mentioned, became the standards by which now technology companies and, and I don't want to just say corporate America because they went beyond that. Most of the laws, um, at least in principle, that were developed by committees that you co-chaired, that I co-chaired with Jim Tobias, uh, Larry Skadden, Jim Thatcher, all, all these folks there, um, 
they have become the, the foundation stone for most of the laws that are out there outside the U.S., whether it's, you know, up, up in Canada, um, whether it's over in Europe, uh, the AA, all those standards out in Australia, all of these, all of these were founded on the very standards that, that uh, and the activities that you and yeah, I have. The, the global reach of WCAG is amazing to see. And Judy Brewer, who was right. there pushing with resilience and now at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, it's amazing to see that it's just accepted as the way to go. And sure, there's criticism of WCAG and it's morphing and sometimes a little complicated, but it's accepted. It's known everywhere. It, it's it it functionally is in every technology digital technology standard that I'm aware of. If, if you're going to look, their guidelines true, but actually a lot of people don't understand. WCAG is actually an ISO standard. It is an international standard, so people should understand that um, it contains the fruitage that you need in order to to create mandates as as we've seen them. Yeah, yeah. very cool. You you did a little after after Yahoo. Um, you went over to Verizon, and and then since Verizon, you're here today as a as a private consultant. So again, kind of take us down that path. Yeah, you know when I joined Yahoo, I was so impressed by the scale and impact of a company of that size. What they had at that time, eight hundred million daily active users. So we changed one line of code, and boom, you've changed the world. I also love the fact that Yahoo had and still does have an amazing heart. Their engineers, their designers, their executives really wanted to do the right thing. Maybe you don't see that quite often. You don't realize it, but they really uh, had it together. And they let me pursue a lot of really wonderful projects. Um, that included some nonprofit startups that I got involved with, Teach Access, uh, XR access, procure access. We can talk about those. A few years into my time at Yahoo, Verizon bought Yahoo. And it's like, oh, now I'm really at a big company of scale. Verizon also was really interested in upping their game on accessibility. So I learned how do you manipulate your way through a 150,000 employee corporation, you know, major capitalization. Um, for three years, we worked with Verizon, and then they realized maybe they didn't really want to be in the internet content game. It's a whole different world than a regulated phone company. So Verizon sold Yahoo. We were still there, and we became Yahoo again, and we were bought by uh, Apollo Global Management, a private equity firm. Through all of this, still got to do all this cool stuff with all these other institutions and set some great policies within Yahoo, which pledge we will, as a policy, uh, design our technologies, our apps, our content to be accessible. Yeah, uh, excellent. Yeah. Let me, let me, I want to amplify something that you said, Larry, because I think it's important for, again, for, for the folks that are listening to this program. You said that, you know, in organizations like Verizon, uh, Yahoo, and we could, we could carry that forward in Google, in, in Amazon. Um, there are in Apple, certainly IBM, as you, you and I both know over the years, the folks there that work on accessibility, they have the same kind of passion and dedication that you and I have done just as private, you know, entrepreneurs and, and professionals. And, and no one should ever take anything away from them just because the elephant sort of moves a little bit slower doesn't take away from the fact that they are vetted, they're interested in making sure that we uh, accomplish as much as we possibly can for, you know, for individuals with disabilities. Would you agree? Yeah, I don't know another community of professionals that is so cohesive, mutually supportive, happy to go outside the bounds of their present job at a corporation and help each other. It's really an incredible community, yeah. and uh, they become friends. They become allies. Uh, maybe there are some other professions that are like that, but I can't say I'm aware of them. Uh, and it, it's really incredible where they all go. Uh, one of the other people I hired at NCAM was Andrew Kirkpatrick. There you go. Uh, Andrew just finished his 18-year tenure at Adobe, but... He became one of the leaders across industry, and everyone knows Andrew. And 
he shaped the WCAG standards. So it's, it is really uh, the sort of roots of a, an amazing community as people move from one area to another. And then some of the younger people coming up now came out of these projects. I mentioned Teach Access. Uh, this is a coalition we put together, uh, me and Mike Shabanek and the folks at Facebook, Jeff Whelan, then joined people from Google and Apple and Intuit and all over to begin teaching about accessibility in higher ed in core curriculum, computer science 101, uh, human computer interface, web design. We wanted those students to learn about accessibility before they graduated. And that has created some great people now who are becoming leaders in the field as well. Yeah. So we're really passing it on uh, through Teach Access. Yeah, exactly. We're, 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 we're working on creating the next generation of accessibility uh, experts. I mean, ultimately, I think we'd like, it, like to have it all completely ingrained in the, you know, the inclusive nature and the very fiber of civilization as, as we all know it, as we all want it. But you're absolutely right. So we've got, and you and I have talked about this, we have basically three initiatives that I, I really think are, are very important, very critical. You've talked about Teach Access. Um, we've got Procure Access and we have XR Access. You want to talk about the other two? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, for Teach Access, you ask, uh, what are some of my great accomplishments? One of the best things I love about high tech is swag. And one of the best pieces of swag we made were these hats that say Born Accessible. Yeah. And that's that's the the essence. Uh, a woman named Betsy Bowman, who was CEO of Benetech, I believe she came up with that term. Uh, and people get it right away. Ooh, born, born, yeah, start out that way. So that's where Teach Access went into. Procure Access is further down the road. Uh, a number of us were at a conference, uh, people from Microsoft and Google and Apple and Amazon, and we're frustrated that our vendors that we bought stuff from we're selling stuff to us that wasn't accessible. And we're like, wait a minute, we're buying this stuff. Shouldn't we have some control here? Shouldn't we not have to buy things that are broken? We decided to band together after our lawyers made sure that we weren't creating some sort of collusion or monopoly and said, you know what? We're going to decide and tell our vendors we will not buy broken stuff anymore. You need to deliver it accessibly. As a bare minimum, do an audit, tell us what your roadmap is. And we met every Friday for well over a year uh, with all these people who, again, we just enjoyed hanging out with each other on Zoom every Friday. Right. Eventually, we invited in Disability In, a big organization that is advocates for people with disabilities. They are now managing Procure Access. I understand 35 companies have now signed on to a statement that said, we will incorporate accessibility into our procurement policies. And it might not be glamorous. It might not feel all that cutting edge, but boy, what an impact. I, I've tried to add up how much money these major corporations spend every year on acquiring particularly software for their employees and for their customers. We're well over a trillion dollars in purchases. Wow. And, and people are waking up. You know, this is a business proposition. This is not begging for, please do the right thing uh, for altruistic reasons. This is, you want to sell something, you build it right. Exactly. This Pretty is Pretty compelling. Just yeah, exactly. This is this is a way of of uh, adding kindling to the fire that we know already there, and and getting it to blow up in in literally in in the sense of of creating something that we've known all along that needs to be there in, in place of, of procurement. Okay. I talked to uh, Jeff uh, um, Weasel. Whistle. 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 Uh, whistle. 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 Yeah. Um, uh, just a few days ago, we were, we were, we were talking about this and we talked about procurement. Um, so I know that we're interested in audio, I getting involved in adopting some of those standards as well, become a part of, yes. of that, uh, initiative as well. So I'm looking forward to working yeah. uh, with them and with, with the other companies. So we, we have, we've got procure, we have teach access, we have procure access. XR access, I think, is the one that's the outlier in a li in, in a little way because folks don't necessarily yeah. really. They're still we're still trying to figure out well how do we use XR, AR, you know, MR in terms of or, or VR in terms of accessibility. But go ahead and yeah. talk about that. Yeah, it was um, oh boy, uh, it's probably four years ago now, maybe five, 
And once again, periodically, the whole notion of virtual reality was showing up as it has now periodically over the past many decades. It's like, all right, it's going to be a thing. It's going to break into the mainstream, not just for gamers, but for everybody. And a number of us said, whoa, if this is really going to affect our education systems, our commerce systems, our social lives, our entertainment, we need to do something to make sure it's made accessible. And uh, a professor at Cornell Tech, Shiri Azenkot, uh, approached me and said, you want to do like a seminar on how to make VR accessible? I said, yeah, but not a seminar. I want to go big. Let's have an entire conference. Let's create an entity uh, and pull people together because it was hot. It was the hot technology. This is even before Facebook became meta. Uh, and there's some great tech coming out, Magic Leap, and, and Google had some glasses. And we said, we better get in there now or it's going to be too late. And so a lot of dedicated people came together. We had an event on the Cornell Tech campus before COVID. And it was really exciting. And people were trying stuff out and brainstorming. How do we do this? How do you put closed captions in a set of goggles? How does a blind person use a virtual reality headset? It was really cool, really interesting. Um, I think what happened is basically the VR excitement and the bandwagon got tempered a little bit. Uh, it hadn't really driven itself into the mainstream. Then Meta came along and we said, okay, now it's real. And so Mike Shabanek at Facebook and now Meta were looking at how they could make sure the technology they're developing is accessible. Apple, over a long period of time, was developing what is now the Vision Pro. And I tried them out recently. And they have built a SDK, a software developer's kit, to make their technology accessible. Uh, and I've already experienced some of that. Um, I think one of the waves of emerging technologies that happen, and this happens all the time, along comes AI and nothing else matters. Nothing. Um, if you don't have an AI strategy, you're not in this world. It might have pushed uh, the AR, VR world a little bit aside and people are still trying to figure out what's the human factors part of VR. Do I want to wear goggles? Do I want something really lightweight and simple? Do I want to augment my daily reality by looking and have stuff introduced to me, you know, like captions in my glasses, or do I want to immerse myself 100% and not engage with the outside world? And that's still being debated. People are still trying to figure that out. But I think we can appreciate that. It just, it's another layer of complexity when we're talking about, you, you know, you've mentioned more than a couple of times now, HCI. So we're talking about human computer interaction, right? And, and usability and user experience where individuals with disabilities are concerned. I've seen, and I know we both have seen some great advances where AI, VR, you know, when I first worked on VR, you know, the per first person I was working with, and this goes back to the late nineties, early two thousands, Jaron Lanier. Oh, I don't know if you remember when Jaron yeah. would come to CSUN, right? I think he gave at least one keynote, if not two. And we went and we did the, we, we did the, uh, the helmets and the glasses with, with him when he was with VPL, right? And so that was my first uh, opportunity. I literally worked with him, uh, on some standards that he was working on to integrate some notion of accessibility into the virtual reality. So here we are now 25 years later. And we've got mixed reality. We have augmented reality. You know, we, we've got extended reality. All of those and AI running kind of parallel to one another. AI, AI's got a little bit more of the publicity just because, but the reality is that those two industries are kind of merging together and we're seeing some very cool um, uh, things come out uh, and products coming out. And, and XR Access is still an ongoing operation. It's within Cornell Tech now. Uh, Dylan Fox is a, uh, a really brilliant scientist who's now running it, the ops manager, with uh, Professor Azenkot at Cornell Tech. They've got their annual conference coming up in June. Right. It's going to be a hybrid, both on campus at Cornell Tech uh, in New York City and online. And they're going to be showing some very cool stuff, incorporating AI into how you achieve accessibility within those environments. And... Um, they are still there on the cutting edge. 
still preparing for this to be the kind of mainstream tech that if you don't have it and can't use it, you're really going to miss out. And that's what drove us on this is if you can't get a job because you can't access something through VR, that's going to be bad for a lot of people with disabilities. So let's make sure we can make it fully accessible. Yeah, 100%. When did, so when is the XR Access uh, event? Did you say in June, Larry? Yeah, I think it's the uh, first or second week of June. Yep. Uh, XRAccess.org. Find out everything you need to know. Teach Access is teachaccess.org. And Procure Access is within Disability In, but just do a search for Procure Access. You'll yeah, find and it. If, and you'll find it. Yeah, awesome. So some really, really great initiatives, Larry. And, and the fact that you've been behind them, they're well-organized. Uh, they're well-oiled machines, I think, by mm -hmm. by and large, from from my perspective. And these are things that we want to invite everyone in our community, professional or otherwise, particularly individuals with disabilities. We need your involvement in these technologies, in the adv advanced technologies. It would be just great, just for once, to be on the cutting edge of a brand new technology. And for once, we're thinking accessibility, right? Right from the very start, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah, we're we're a little late on AI, but it's earlier than any other development. I you know, think so. I, I, the timeline for like when movies became accessible in theaters that was over sixty years. TV was like forty years before we ever got captioning, and then the internet. You know, that was ten years. AI really from pretty early days. People were like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. We need to keep both how to exploit it for good. And how to beware, make sure it doesn't cause harm. We got in there pretty early and we're obviously full stop doing it right now. I ran into Judy Brewer at a hackathon at MIT a couple of weeks ago, and she's all over what's going on at the Office of Science Technology Policy on the executive order on AI and how we should be red teaming and make sure things are done right. But also, of course, what fun ways we can exploit it to make it work. Uh, do work for us that um, can advance the, the whole cause that we're working on. Yeah, that's awesome. It's great to have someone like Judy there. She knows it. She's she's been in this industry for a long time. We owe her a lot uh, from that from that standpoint. So, Larry, um, let's take you from AI. Two th two last questions I want to ask you. First of all, where do you see AI going? For, again, from your perspective. Um, maybe more profoundly, as it affects the media and accessibility world, is that's your sweet spot, right? And then after that, where are you? Where are you going? What are you doing as uh, Larry Goldberg Inc.? <laughs> yeah, uh, they actually kind of come together. Of course, you can't do new things without having an AI strategy of some sort. Uh, I think I am um, a champion of any great technology that can help people. For AI, I saw the early days of what it could do when uh, automatic speech recognition for captioning started. And that's a form of AI. And YouTube uh, provided it very early, really early. I think it was 15 years ago they began doing automatic speech for captioning in YouTube. I was very concerned because the quality was poor, really poor. And... Uh, WGBH had just started putting some of its programs in YouTube, one of kids' shows, like Arthur. And at first, we weren't manually captioning those, so that you turned on the ASR, and words would come up that kids shouldn't see. And people at GBH freaked out. There was some profanity on Arthur. I happened to know someone at Google and at YouTube and I called this. Now, this is early days. You can actually call someone and get something done. I said, this is a real problem. You are what's now called hallucinating, perhaps, creating words on screen that should not appear. And they responded immediately. And they said, you know what? We're using the web as our database for recognizing words. Bad words are spoken on the web quite often. And they put in some sort of filter immediately to avoid those kinds of mistakes. Well, I'm worried today that people are going to be rushing out with too much hype around AI solutions for people with disabilities that aren't ready. But okay. competition is driving people to go to market. Try, well, let's just try it out in the public. I was like, you know, there are some concerns we might have. Uh, Professor Yuta Trevorenis up in Toronto has warned 
that people with disabilities actually often have technology inside them. They rely on it for prosthetics, for wayfinding. Let's not make mistakes that could cause harm. Let's do some really careful analysis. And while we're doing that, let's also find some cool things. So captioning now online using uh, AI is pretty darn good. Yeah. Not great all the time. You have a heavy accent. You got noise. It's not going to work for you. You have dysarthic speech uh, because of a disability. It's not going to work for you. So again, there's still work to be done. AI for image recognition. Well, this leads me into where I'm going now. I have become an advisor and a mentor to a number of startups in the field, and I am having a ball. And one of them is called Sign Up, and this is adding sign language to streaming video right now on Disney Plus and Netflix, where you can pop up an interpreter. These interpreters are humans. Humans still have value in this world, okay. and they're doing very important, high-quality sign language. But of course, our investors are asking, what about AI? And our answer is, work needs to be done before you even think about assigning avatar. And some of them are already popping up, but the deaf community has made it very clear. It's not good enough yet. Unfortunately, it will be launched upon the public before it's really of the high quality we want to see. There's another company you might know, Scribly. They are providing alt text for images because it's missing all over the web. There's not enough behind the scenes description of images. And of course, AI is doing a big job today on recognizing images, but not necessarily in context, not necessarily meaningfully uh, to help people understand what images are appearing before them. So I'm working with seven to 10 startups as advisors, as, as a partner, as a consultant, as an equity advisor. All of them have one connection or another to AI. So it's funny because you ask what I'm doing next, and it's like I wasn't planning to make my life about AI, but these startups have to. So I'm trying to become quite expert on the field. Uh, no one can really because it's moving so fast, but I'm learning, and I'm helping these startups. A lot of them women-founded, a lot of disability-founded startups, uh, helping them launch into the mainstream of um, startup world. Yeah, that's that's awesome, Larry. We really appreciate your involvement because, you know, with any industry, as you said, any technology, there's a period of maturation, right? That that just has to take place. So, so two things along those lines. One is, are we patient enough to wait for things to come to the point where the quality really now outshines? the original prototypes. Mm. Unfortunately, we work in a very agile development or lean development type world. So it's kind of like you release a, a product or a technology knowing that it's, it's, it's got bugs, it's got problems with it. And we're, we're seeing a, a lot of that. AI is just the one that's at the forefront because it's where all the press is going. But it's, it's true across the board. I mean, I think back to for example, days of, of the OS and accessibility or days in the initial uh, automated validation services. And, and these were technologies that we needed, but also needed time of maturation before they could, they could really serve users with disabilities. You mentioned uh, Yuta Trevianis a little bit earlier. And, you know, in her uh, talk last year at... Um, at M Enabling, she she brought into the equation, the accessibility equation, a, a term that until now I didn't I personally didn't appreciate the importance. So for the last 30 years for me, it's been all about accessibility and usability, right? The two go hand in hand. You can't build something and say it's accessible if it's not usable, right? I could put alt text on an image, but if I have no context around that image, it's not really usable to me, right? But, right. but you'd have brought in something else that I think this is where AI really has to focus on, and that's equitability, right? Not edging out, you know, the disparate populations, including individuals with disabilities and that. So it's accessibility, usability, and equitability. And those three things now are the going forward uh, marching plans for, for everything that we design and develop. Yeah. Uh, um, for technology, well, people with disabilities. You mentioned patience. Um, I think we're in this capitalist society. Um, I wish we could be more patient before we launch things before they were ready. And we've seen some 
bad results from launching too fast. Yeah. And I don't have to cite them, but even in recent days, there's been some mistakes where you got to scratch your head and say, really? They didn't test this first right? with some of the imagery, the generative AI. It's like, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot by releasing this stuff and making yourself look bad. So I wish we had more patience, but people are feeling pressured to get stuff out there. The good actors, people we know, the people we care about, we're going to keep pitching away and make sure that do no harm is something we can live up to uh, and wait for the quality. Uh, it might take a little longer for us to get there with a fully accessible, high quality generative AI and similar technologies. We're going to keep doing it. We may not become the unicorn that some of these other companies will, but we're going to be a good horse to ride on regardless. Exactly. Exactly. Larry, uh, as we close the show out, any parting words of encouragement or, or thoughts that you want to make sure you carry that message out to, to all those in our audience? Uh, well, I think for you and I, Mike, and the OGs in this field, pass it on. Um, I take calls from people with ideas. They say, can I pick your brain? And it's like, I picture this bird eating away at my brain. I don't know if there's much left, but it, I encourage so much the the passion and the attitude. So I really love looking forward to the people who are going to pick up this work, supporting them, uh, and, and keep your optimism there. It's unfortunate that one of the most important skills you must have in the field of accessibility is resilience. Because you're going to get knocked down over and over again. And maybe your bosses are going to say, why are we bothering? But hang in there because it's rewarding one way or another. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I always uh, live by uh, uh, a Calvin Coolidge uh, uh, saying, "Persistence is omnipotent." Right, yeah. and so you just keep, just keep plugging away and keep fighting the the, the good fight, so to speak. Yeah. Well, uh, all of us here at the Hearsay Podcast are just just very, very uh, happy to uh, be with you today. Um, uh, Larry Goldberg, is, as we've all heard, Larry's got a, a history uh, that's unlike uh, many others uh, in, in our field. So we're very appreciative. Thank you, Larry, for, for being with us on our show today. Uh, so this is our first episode of Hearsay in Year 2. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, some of our, our other interviews that you'll see coming up. Thank you all for, uh, for being with us. And Larry, uh, we'll, we'll see you, I think, in a, in, in a couple of weeks. Thank you for having me on, Mike. It's great to be here. Hearsay is produced by Sojin Rank, Mike Barton, Mariella Polino, and Missy Jensen. Edited by Alex Dorier. If you enjoyed this podcast and don't want to miss future episodes, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time.